1986, I graduated from high school. I'm 51 years old, for those of you who are trying to figure that out. <laughs> I went to Florida State University, spent the first summer, um, the first summer set of classes off campus at a thing called Osceola Hall, which was a private dorm. And then I had waited all this time because I had, I had put my name in early. I got to live in Landis Hall. That's right in the center of FSU campus. Some of you know where that is. Big, old, beautiful brick building. Um, there with a, just a, a beautiful central location. And I remember um, moving into Landis Hall for the fall semester, and, you know, freshman dorms are a mess. I mean, a real mess. At that time, at least, it was guys on one floor, girls on another floor. I'm afraid that's probably not the way it is anymore. But anyways, um, I was on the all-guys floor, fourth floor, and looked out over Landis Green. And at that time, I had, of course, like many college freshmen, gone off to FSU with a large stereo system. As a kid growing up, I always loved music, and um, I worked real hard and made a little bit of money, and I bought quite a loud stereo system, and I enjoyed that a lot. And we had this weird thing going on the fourth floor. You could just turn up the music, leave your door open, and go down the hall to the bathroom and uh, just enjoy your music all the way down the hall in the bathroom. And whoever had it on first, they got to keep it on at least while, you know, they went down to brush their teeth or do whatever they did. And so one particular, you know, these guys would play Led Zeppelin and, you know, all kinds of stuff that was just, you know, some music that was just crazy. And I had Christian music. I had already started walking with the Lord at that point. And so I remember back in the days of Petra, some of you have heard of Petra, and I, I see somebody back there lifting their hand. Yeah, he's a metalhead Petra. So, um, Petra was a Christian rock band that was really quite amazing, and um, I just would turn that thing up. This was back in the days. We had these round black things. They were called LPs or long plays. They were records, guys, gals, so they were records. So, I put that thing on, and um, I went down the hall to get my teeth brushed and everything, and that thing's playing. And I come back, and there's this guy sitting on my bed amidst the very loud music. And I went to turn it down, and he goes, no, no, stop, leave it on. And he's sitting there looking at that record album, and he's listening to it. And finally, the song ends, and I look at him, and um, he goes, Petra. I said, yeah, Petra. And he goes, yeah, I remember that. And I said, really? I said, are you a Christian? And by this time, he had stood up and moved for the door. And he just looked at me and he said, backslidden. And he walked out the door. So I remember thinking, wow, he's backslidden and he just walks out the door. And I remember, I remember praying for him at that moment. I remember lifting him up to the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't know who this guy is. He was from Ocala. That's all I knew. And um, I prayed for him. Well, um, freshman year went by and uh, went off the summer. I, I went on a summer mission trip, came back to Florida State um, for my sophomore year. And I'm there at um, Campus Crusade for Christ meeting. And uh, as the fall semester started going again in sophomore year, and that same guy walked into Campus Crusade for Christ. And he had a totally different look on his face. It wasn't one of burden and frustration, but it was one of joy. And I looked at him and I said, hey, you're the guy that knows Petra. And he goes, hey, you're the guy that blasts Petra. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and I, I just said, are you still backslidden? And he said, by the grace of God, no. Ken Osley went on to become my, one of my absolute closest friends, five very close friends during my college years. Um, he discipled some guys through Campus Crusade. I discipled some guys through Campus Crusade. He went on to serve for 20 years with Campus Crusade for Christ as full-time staff. Um, he was especially burdened for college students um, really all around the nation, but um, he was kind of a, a guy that was not afraid to go on the radical edge every year for gay pride march in um, San Francisco. He would go and fly out to San Francisco to be there for the gay pride march because he knew that there were men and women in that crowd that were deeply hurting. And he would go and he would sit and just talk with them and very often lead people to Christ on the edge of gay pride week. Um, not revolting against them, not yelling at them, not condemning them, but sharing with them the love of Christ. 
Well, Ken Osley's story of so quickly saying backslidden and walking away is where we can find a, a picture of what we see God doing through Hosea and in the life of Hosea. We have studied 13 chapters, primarily filled with judgment, as the nation of Israel, though given everything, turned away from God and grotesquely turned away from God, turned away from God to worship other things, even after he had delivered them from Egypt, after he had come and provided for them in the desert, after he had come and time and time again showed them that his word was true and his love was great, and they would still go out and worship the Baals. They would still go out to pagan nations and depend upon other nations for their protection. You see, they were fraught with this thing called sin welling up in their heart. And even though God had said, come to me, you are my nation, I have a special plan for you, I'm going to use you among all the nations, they would run away so quickly. Well, the book of Hosea is largely God's judgment upon that and showing that he is holy and that we are not. He's pointing out our problem. You know, most of the time, we need to first see our problem before we can come to a solution. And so that's what we've seen in Hosea. But when we come to the final chapter, which is what's on the box, in the box on the page, and we've studied last week, verses 1, 2, and 3, we come to this picture of God calling, Hosea, God calling through Hosea the nation of Israel back to himself. And we see that it's a picture of what God is going to do. Um, before we get to that text, I want to read for you a great quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And um, this is not on the back side. Don't turn to the back side. You'll be confused. Um, this is a, a separate quote. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is um, perhaps one of my favorite preacher authors. Um, he was a man who stood very much alone in the pulpit of England um, at his church that became a very uh, exceedingly large church. By the time he was 21 years old, he was preaching to thousands of people. And um, he died of an, uh, just a, an early, he died in his 50s um, as a result of exhaustion. Um, but he was a man of God that stuck with God's word and preached at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, um, a Baptist church in London. At the time, it was the largest church in the world. But I want you to hear how Spurgeon opens and how he thinks about this great contrast between our backsliding tendencies and God's grace. Listen to these, listen to this quote. All through the Scripture, there is revealed a vehement contest between man's sin and God's grace, each of them striving to become more abundant than the other. Sin, like a dragon, pours forth floods from its mouth, and God's mercy as a shoreless ocean, think about that, a shoreless ocean rolls in greater majesty Sin abounds so that none can measure its heinousness or power, but where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. In the text, sin abounds. They're backsliding. This is a comprehensiveness in that, there is a comprehensiveness in that word, a dreadful abyss of iniquity, but grace abounds yet more. I will heal their backsliding. In this we see the height and the depth of grace like the God from who it came, incomprehensible and infinite. You see, in this picture, in this main text that we're going to see this morning, in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 14, we see the reality of our backsliding. We see the reality of our sin, but we see that the only hope out of that is not our goodness, is not our determination, it's not in our strength, but salvation is of God. And the sanctification process of continuing with God once we have come to him in faith is also of God. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But he also said, with me, you can do 
anything. So this morning as we come to this, as we come to this text, as we see this, we want to remember what comes just before it in this call to repentance. And I want you to notice this, the call to repentance. And this is what we saw last week. In verse 1 it says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled, underline the word stumbled, because of your iniquity. Let your, li- your eyes drop all the way to the last verse. Look at the last verse in verse 9. Look what it says. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. So this is the last verse of the whole book. Notice what he says. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are what? Okay, that was very few of you. Look at verse 9. Look what it says in the middle of verse 9. It says, for the ways of the Lord are right. And the upright walk in them. But look what it says at the end. But transgressors do what? Stumble Stumble in them. So circle the word stumble right there. So this is poetry. We need to remember the genre. This is poetry. And as we study much of the book of Hosea, we see it's written in Hebraic poetry that is that is this beautiful twisting and turning thing, a play on words and a play on meanings, and yet so beautifully describing the thoughts that God has for us, and so powerfully describing that. But I want you to notice in verse 1 it's talking about you stumble because of your iniquity, but some are going to be turned back to God and find all of his blessings. Then we go down to verse 9, let the wise understand these things, the upright walk in the ways of God, But those who are transgressors, those who will not turn back, what do they do? They stumble in the ways and in the words of God. They never make it out of their folly. They're entrapped in their sin, and they stumble in that. You remember what we said last week about stumbling, or excuse me, two weeks ago about stumbling, and teach me to talk about stumbling. I mean, we, we, you know, when you stumble, it hurts. When you stumble, it's shameful. It's embarrassing very often. When you stumble, there's, there's things that break. And we see that that's what sin does. So in verse 1, up there at the top, return Israel to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words. Remember, words mean things, and it's important to God. Take with you words and return to the Lord. So you don't just come and act like nothing happened. You come with your words and you tell to God how you have wronged him, how you have sinned against him. You confess to him your sin. You agree with him about your sin. Take with you words and return to the Lord and say to him, here it is, take away all iniquity. You see, this is that, that hope of true forgiveness, that call for true forgiveness. Accept what is good and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. That means we're going to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to actually do something with our repentance. Number three, Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. So we're not going to depend upon other nations. We're not going to depend upon weapons of war. We're not going to pray to idols anymore. For in you, the orphan finds mercy. Let's just remember and jot these things down. The last time we studied, we said the call to repent and return to God. And here it is. Number one, Hosea's command for Israel to repent is a precursor of the grand call for all to repent under the new covenant in Christ Jesus. So Hosea is not just written for the nation of Israel. Hosea is written for all that come after him to see that God is calling all to repentance. This is the way God works. He calls us to the new covenant in Christ that Jesus is going to go to the cross and pay for our sins, the final sacrifice for all things. And the new covenant is is that the law is fulfilled in Christ. You come to Christ. That is the picture. That is how we are set free from the law of sin and death. Look at number two. Sin causes distance from God and stumbling in life. That was in verse one. We see that. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Number three. We said that with God, this is important for you to remember, when, with God, repentance involves words and actions. With God, repentance involves words and actions. That was what we saw in verse 2. Take with you words. Return to the Lord. And then we see that there's going to be action upon that. We're going to pay with bulls. We're going to the vows of our lips. We're going to put into motion 
action, and that's how it is for you and me, that we not only say to God our words of repentance, but we also come to God in real action, turning away from our sin and turning to what is right. Number four, with God, repentance also involves what? Faith. And we see that in verse 3. With God, repentance also involves faith. This is knowing and trusting in God's promise. And so, that's what verse 3 is saying. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will not say anymore to our God, to the work of our hands. He's saying that we're going to turn away, and we're going to have trust in God, not trust in the things of this life. And so, now we come to this next verse that is perhaps the most pivotal verse in the whole book of Hosea. Here we find the solution to the problem. Here God is showing us not only that there is sin, but we also see that there is the hope of that sin being properly dealt with and that God would come and heal our brokenness. Look with me in verse 4. I've underlined it for you. I will heal their apostasy. Now, what does apostasy mean? Except that apostasy is the picture of that you once believed something, you once walked in a way that you knew was right, but then you leave it. You turn away from it, and you, you go the other direction. You go away from what you believed was right. And here we see this specifically in regard to faith, that they were apostate. They had left their God, the God that had been so faithful to them. If you have a King James version of the Bible, it says backsliding. And indeed, I want to use backsliding this morning. Um, backsliding is a, is a very common phrase. It's one that I heard that freshman day in the dorm room when Ken Osley looked at me and he said, backslidden. And he knew it well. Notice with me here. He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the valley. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His roots, his shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. So Lebanon is this lush area where they don't have um, long periods of drought. That, that because of the way the, the wind patterns come in and the, the weather patterns come in off the Mediterranean, it's constantly getting good rain. And it's just these beautiful mountains that are very green, pretty much year-round, but they're very productive agriculturally. And so this is that picture that that Israel is going to be restored like the beauty of this very fertile area of Lebanon. You see all of these phrases here that are agricultural. And it's this, look at verse 7. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. Oh, wow. So they're going to come back and dwell with God. And they will flourish like the grain. They will, shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Look at verse 8. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. you know, what he's saying is, he says, I'm so much better than your idols. When you come back, I'm going to actually answer you. An idol can't answer you. I am so much better than your idol. Oh, Ephraim, what have I have to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. And then we see that challenge at the end that sounds like the Proverbs, that if you're wise, listen. And so I want to say to you today, this morning, as we look at just verse 4, I say if you're wise, listen to these words. Look at verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. There's five key words I want us to see, and I've outlined them here. His healing is our hope. His healing is our hope. The first word I want us to quickly see is the word backsliding. The word backsliding. Oh, the wretched sin of our fickle, wayward hearts. You see, we, we so easily turn away from what is right and true. We so easily turn away from that which touched us. 
You would think that after someone comes and experiences the grace and the majesty of God, that we would forever be bonded to him, that we would forever be close to him. Think about, for those of you who have come to faith in Jesus, think about what it was like when you first discovered what it felt like to be forgiven of your sin. What it felt like to know the creator of the universe personally. What it was like when you would go and you would read his word and you would hear him speak through the words on the page and he he was walking with you and talking with you and you were diligent to look and to listen. And when you would hear sermons preached, you couldn't believe, you couldn't get enough. That there was this, there was this change of heart and a change of life. And as he began to reveal himself to you, that your heart opened and budded before him. This picture of this white thing. But how our sinful, wretched hearts in the flesh can still be so fickle, yet it was so fine, but then we turn away after the things that are right in front of us. God becomes a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. Sin gradually takes a little bit more time and a little bit more time. And after a little while, we find ourselves where we don't even know how to get back very often. How we fill it in, drift away from the intimacy of our Savior's love. At once we understood that he died on the cross for me, for my foolishness, for my lies, for my lust for my selfishness, that Christ would die for that. Oh, you, the innocent Lamb of God, the one who created the world, leaves the halls of heaven that is rejected upon this earth, nailed to a cross for my sins. Why would you do this? You would sweat drops of blood for me. And yet, before very long, we're living in our sin and sometimes even bragging about it very often running without regard to what he has done. What is the hope? What is the hope for a hardened, wayward heart? The next word is heal. I want you to see this phrase. Notice here what it says. I will heal their backsliding. Notice the screen up there. We've looked at the word backsliding. We, 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 very often would be able to say, yes, I, I know what that feels like. Some of you would say, Pastor, I'm like your friend Ken Osley. I mean, I'm here today, but I know good and well, I'm not really here today. My heart isn't here. My heart isn't before God. The backsliding part I know well. What is the hope? Well, the hope is the word heal. And in this, we see that it is God who comes and he sees our backsliding as a sickness. It's something that has to be cured. It's an illness. It's a brokenness. So fill that in. He cures the disease of backsliding. You know, some diseases come on slow. Some of our physical problems come on slow. It's something that you don't even know about for a long period of time. And maybe it's even something that you're doing that you don't even realize is hurting you. And so you, you go through a long period of time, and before very long, you realize, oh my goodness, I need surgery because of all of that crazy stuff I did as a kid in sports, and my body now doesn't heal from all of those things very well. Or sometimes it's very fast. You get out of the car, and you're walking into the convention center for Um, graduation, and your husband's pulling away, and you turn and fall on the ground, and suddenly you're hurt. So sometimes our brokenness comes on fast. Sometimes it comes on very slowly. There's, There's very often this picture that it is a when, when we see that God is saying, I will heal your brokenness, he's saying, look, you're sick. You're broken, and you need to be healed. It was quite amazing that This passage says, I will heal their apostasy. It doesn't say, I will pardon their apostasy. I will forgive their apostasy. That's not what it says. You see, the real need is even more than the forgiveness. The real need is to be healed from it so that we don't keep going back. And so he also doesn't say, I will banish or destroy you who are sick. 
He says, I will heal you. Now, there are some who believe that you can lose your salvation. And there's a multitude of passages that in the Bible make very clear that it is impossible for anyone that is God's to be lost. We believe very carefully and very, very thoughtfully in something that is called the, the perseverance of the saints, and we believe in the picture that God is going to eventually bring us back and hold on to us in all of this life. But here we see that He doesn't come and destroy us and cut us off for those who are His. He comes to heal us. How does He heal us? Number three, I want you to see this word. And notice on the screen in front of you, look what it says. He says, I will heal their backsliding. So we've looked at backsliding, we've looked at heal, but now how is it that we are healed? It is Jehovah God. It is Yahweh God. He says, I will heal you. I'm not going to send a minister to heal you. I'm not going to heal you even through a word in this. Here we're saying that in this picture of Hosea's poetry, the point is being made that God is saying, I'm going to come heal you. I'm not going to send Aaron. I'm not going to send Moses. I'm not going to send a prophet. I'm not going to send Hosea. God is saying, I am the one that can do surgery on your heart. Because what he's saying as well is this. He's saying, your sin is a disease. It has to be cured. And I am the physician that can cure it. And so we see that he is the one that is the one God is talking about himself. So this is God himself that is going to do this. And let's remember how good and able he is to heal. This is the Philodon, the all-powerful creator. This is the omnipotent creator. This is the one that there is nothing that is too difficult for him. His arm is not so short that it cannot save. There has never been a problem that he cannot solve. This is the one who speaks and worlds come into existence. Stars come out of his mouth. This is the eternal creator of the universe, and he is able to heal our sin problem. Much of the Bible is showing us that it is the Lord who is our healer. In Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, Yahweh Rapha is this, that the Lord is your healer. Over and over again, we see that God is showing the nation of Israel that if they have any hope, it's not in them, it's not in anything else, it's in Him. Amen. And so God's own name is the Lord your healer. Now, I know that very often we need to be healed physically. I mean, I am in a sling this morning, and it's painful. And many of you have many things that you've been through or things that you're going through or just wait, it's coming. And you know how that goes. And we feel the physical need. But my dear friends, our physical need is nothing in comparison to the spiritual need of our hearts being right before God. Amen. When we look and when we think about the day of judgment that is coming, the greatest need that we have is that our heart is healed and right before God. And so what we see over and over is that the Lord is showing them, yes, you have physical needs, but your greatest need is to be made right with me. You're still going to die in this life. You're still going to pass away. Eventually, you're going to wear out or eventually something's going to take you. The point is, where are you with me in eternity? And so here we see that the Lord is saying, I am the one who heals you. God is not going to share his glory with us. He is not going to share his glory with anyone else. God is intent. He's a jealous God that wants our, our attention for him and for him alone. And so he does not share his work in any way that has us look somewhere else for our salvation. So backsliding, heal, I. He says, I will heal their backsliding. Well, the next one that I want to point out is verse is number four, and it's the word will. This is a rather obscure word in the text very often. It's, it's simply an operative word that allows other words to work. 
But notice here what it says. It says, I will heal their backsliding. I want you to notice the certainty that is here. It is not a hypothetical. It is not a subjective. It is not something that is perhaps optional. God is saying, I will heal my children's backsliding. You see, there is the certainty of his promise, and it is sure. God's word is ours to plead. You see, this is where you and I, by faith, can come before God and say, Lord, you have said that you will heal my heart. You have said that you can heal my backsliding. You have said that you can stop my sin. And so, Lord, by faith, I plead with you to do what you said. You see, this is what helps us see that our holy life is not our own doing, but it's God's doing in us, and it causes us to be all the more grateful for his work of sanctification in us. There's many who falsely believe that, well, if I, just, if I just try harder and if I just act like, you know, these guys at church that are here all the time, I, I almost named some names, but I won't do that um, because they'll come kill me after the service. But, I mean, you know, we won't see how godly they are. But, I mean, you know, there's people that we look at and we, th- we, we think, wow, if I was like him or if I was like her, you know, I'd be, I'd be really probably happy and at peace with, with God and, and I just need to keep, I need to do what they do and and. and we can start to think that it's about us. But this text, and all through the book of Hosea, and all through the book of the Bible, we are seeing that God is saying, just come and cast your hope on me. I can take care of all of your problems. I can be the one who can give you the peace and the grace and the strength to make it through the finish line into my presence. All of our pain doesn't go away. He never promises that our pain will all be healed. He never promises that all of those things in this earthly life are going to go the way that we desire them to go. Many people misread many passages of the Bible. They take out of context many passages of the Bible. They don't see the big picture in many passages of the Bible that God is talking about. The real healing that you need is an eternal healing, a being set right before him. And that ultimately is what Hosea is pointing to, is that under the new covenant, those who are God's children, those who are really his, they are going to be perfectly, majestically, flawlessly healed and be made right and ready for God's presence. The Lord is your healer, and he says that he will do it with great certainty. I I would love for us to have all of the time to go through John chapter 6. I really want to encourage you to go look up many of these passages when you get home. But in John chapter 6, we see that salvation is clearly of God and no one else. Jesus says that unless the Spirit draws one, he cannot come to me. But when he come to him, we come to him, he says, I will in no wise cast you out. All who come to me will be saved. All who come to me will be saved securely. I lose none that the Father gives me, he says throughout the book of John. God has never lost a child. God brings them home to himself with great safety and security. He says, I will heal your backsliding." The last one is very interesting. It's another one of those operative words. It's, it's there. Notice the phrase on the screen in front of you. I will heal their backsliding. Who is their backsliding? I want you to see this. You see, this is ultimately, this is God's faltering but true people within the nation of Israel or within all of time as we, as we take out um, the, the great picture of Hosea ultimately and what it's pointing to in the new covenant, that God is saying, my people, I heal them. Now, there are many who claim to be God's people. There may even be people who are in the nation of Israel, but they, they were godless people who did not love God, did not know God, even though they had been told, you are my special people for my purposes. I'm going to bring salvation through the Messiah, through your nation, and yet they They continued running away from God, but there was a remnant, and there were some. 
who knew and loved God. And even though they were faltering and even though they would struggle, that that God was saying, I will ultimately bring you home to me. And I'm going to do this not because of any goodness in you, but because of all of the goodness in me. That this is my grace, that where your sin abounds, I'm going to show you that my grace abounds all of the more. And I can swamp your sin with my love. You see, this is why in Romans chapter 2 we would read that, do you not know that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance? It's his goodness. It's not, it's not merely the wrath and it's not merely the, the power of God. It's not merely the majesty of God, but it's his kindness. It's his goodness that even when we keep running away, he says, come here. Come here. I love you. I, I know you did it again. Come here. Let me come and set you free from this. Now, there's, there's many that can be self-deceived in, in, first of all, not knowing Christ and thinking that they do, but, but that's because they ultimately have never come to terms with the the glorious gospel of God's grace. And that's why you need to go to starting point. That's why you need to have friends that you can talk to. That's why you need to come and and sit down and talk about your relationship with the Lord. We We want to help you discern whether or not you have experienced a saving grace of God in your life by coming to him on his terms. But here's part of the picture that we see that God's faltering, but true people within the nation, he comes, and they, here's what they really do. Here's how we know that, that this is his people, that in verse 2, look up at verse 2, it says, take words with you and return to the Lord, say to him, and here they go, take away all iniquity. You see, they're crying out for forgiveness. Those who are going to come and hear the heed, and heed the call to return to the Lord What they're crying out is for God's forgiveness because this is what they so desperately need. Now, I want to help you discern where you are in this. I think it's legitimate to ask yourself these questions, some key questions. Do you anguish over and hate your sin? You really need to think about that. Does your sin bother you? Or do you have the mentality of, doesn't really bother me, I kind of like it. Don't tell me what I got to do. I don't want God to tell me what I got to do. In fact, I don't want to read any more of that because I may have to change. I just want to, want to give you a heads up that if any of those are part of your attitudes, you really need to wonder whether or not you know God at all. Our hearts can be deceived. And what we need to recognize is that the heart of, of coming before God and anguishing over our sin and coming to hate our sin, that is, that is one of the things that can make a guy like Ken Osley so miserable. At the moment, he was saying, yes, I am backslidden. I am backslidden. And part of Ken's testimony is, is that he would eventually say, I don't know whether it was at that moment or whether it was a later time, but I know that my heart was not right with God and I was miserable. I continued in my sin and I was miserable until he came and he got me. My friend, I call you. Do you anguish and hate your sin? Number two, do you want desperately to be delivered from your sin? Do you want desperately to be delivered from your sin? You see, God calls us to come to his deliverance. The third thing I want to ask you is, do you cry out for Christ to heal you from it? Now, the reason I ask you these three questions is because this can point us to knowing Christ altogether. 
in coming to him and recognizing that we have sinned against him and that we need his forgiveness and recognizing that we need to be delivered from this. Now, now we may not understand every aspect of that, but as we come before God and cry out to him, the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that he is the Lord our God, Yahweh Rapha, our healer. You see, there's many who won't come. There are some songs that we sing that Pastor Lucas has taught us and Pastor Ben have taught us over the years that, you know, the the table is set and the invitation is made and there's some who simply won't come. They won't come to the fountain of healing. They won't come to the place of restoration. Do you desire to come? Let Let me promise you this. If you hate and anguish over your sin, if you're miserable in your sin, if you're miserable in your backsliding, if you are saying, I need to be delivered from my sin, and if you are saying, Lord, heal me, this promise is for you. He will heal your backsliding by his love and by his grace. He will come and rescue you from yourself. And this is the glorious gospel of God's great and abounding grace, a grace that overwhelms our foolish, fickle hearts that run away from a loving God and run headlong into our danger. You say, if so, God, this promise is for you. His love will overwhelm and heal your backsliding. Now, I want you to see the last part of this verse. It says, I will love them freely. Around the time that I've, I've told you this story of meeting Ken Osley and hearing him in my freshman year in college, my mother, when I left to go to Florida State, she gave me a little book, very similar to this book, called Morning and Evening. It was devotionals written by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And my mom wrote a note in it saying that, Andrew, this, this author has meant much to me, and I believe it may mean much to you. And that book sat on my shelf um, through my freshman year, and, and I would have some times of victory, and I would have some times of, of defeat and struggle. And eventually, I began reading the daily devotionals. And I came upon what is printed on the page for you this morning. I will love them freely. And it comes from this little phrase, and this is what Charles Haddon Spurgeon does. He takes a tiny phrase, sometimes only a couple of words, and he helps unpack them. And this devotional helped my heart come back to God at an important time in my walk with Christ. I want you to see this. So he takes the little phrase, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, which is the next phrase, and here's what it says. I will love them freely. This sentence is a summation of divinity in miniature. All of God is right here. I will love them freely. He who understands its meaning is a theologian. He who can dive into its fullness is a true master in Israel. It is a condensation of the glorious message of salvation, which was delivered to us in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. The full meaning of this sentence hinges on the word freely. This is the glorious, the truest, the divine way by which love streams from heaven to earth, a spontaneous love flowing forth to those who neither deserved it, purchased it, nor sought after it. It is indeed the only way in which God can love us as such we are. The text is a death blow to all sorts of self-reliance. I will love them freely." Now, if there was any fitness necessary in us, then we would not love, then then he would not love us freely. At least this would be a reduction and a drawback of the freeness of it. But it stands, I will love you freely. We complain, Lord, my heart is so hard. I will love you freely. But I do not feel my need of Christ as I should. I will not love you because you feel your need. I will love you freely. 
But I do not feel that softening spirit which I could desire. Remember, the softening of spirit is not a condition, for there are no conditions. The covenant of grace has no conditionality whatsoever, so that we, without any fitness, may venture upon the promise of God, which has made us, which was made to us in Christ Jesus, when he said, He that believeth on him is not condemned. It is blessed to know that the grace of God is free to us at all times, without preparation, without fitness, without money, without price. I will love them freely. These words invite backsliders to return. Indeed, the text was specifically written for such. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Backslider. Surely the generosity of this promise will at once break your heart and you will return and seek your injured father's face. Friends, listen. Whether or not you see your need, whether or not you even realize the depth of your sin, whether or not you even see your, your need to cry out to God in this, listen, it is the kindness and the loving nature of God that calls you to repentance. And he's saying, just come, just come to me. Even you who have hard heart, when you hear my voice, just come. There is no fitness in you, not even of self-evaluation that can sit there and see all of your need because if you saw all of your need at once, you'd just die. If you saw how much you lack, you just, I'd never make it. God in his grace says, just come. Just come to me because my grace is greater than your sin. Some of you would say, well, pastor, you don't know what I've done. No, but God does. And there's only one thing he doesn't know in the world, and it's a sin that he cannot forgive other than rejection of Christ. He calls you to receive the love of God. Look at John 3, 16 at the bottom. You see, it's all about, I will love them freely. For God so loved, you see, here's the degree. He so loved the world. He so freely loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the way God saves his people, is that he heals them and he loves them freely. Would you pray with me?